Um, what I'm going to talk to you today uh, about, we, when we were kicking around ideas, um, I proposed this topic because this is about the time of the semester, the first couple of weeks, when you're thinking of putting your students in working groups for peer feedback. And the topic that we're going to cover today is um, some patterns that you can use with your students to help them get better at that. Because right out of the gate, not always so good. Um, sometimes they have had bad sort of res um, experiences in peer review groups in the past. I don't know if that's happened to any of you. Um, and it turns out to get um, a rich feedback culture in your classroom, which is really the goal, um, it takes a little bit of cultivating. And so I'm going to give you a couple of things you can hopefully take away and plug right into your class, maybe tomorrow, and um, see, see if those work for you. Um, we have a little catchphrase here, giver's gain. I'll come back to that. Um, but that's to help you remember what we're after. So first, a little bit about me. Um, as Shirley said, I'm a professor of writing and rhetoric, rhetoric and writing. I, got, I did get promoted, so now I'm a full professor. Yay. And uh, I'm associate dean for research and graduate education, so I got more work. That's what happens when you get uh, promoted. And all those other things. So that's me. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question. Oh, I gave it away. <laughs> what does writing look like in your class? What does learning look like in your writing class? And um, for the, for the, the answer for me is something like this. So this picture is um, an approximation of something you all might have heard about in concept, at least, of Vygotsky's idea of the zone of proximal development. You all familiar with that term? Uh, if you haven't heard of that fancy word you, or fancy phrase, you might have heard of something called peer scaffolding, which is what happens in the zone of proximal development. It really means that um, people who are seeing one another in peer, as peer rela relationships in a learning space you can rely on one another as a resource for learning. And if you look at those dancers, you can kind of see there's someone there who's probably looking after the group. There's someone there who's probably sneaking a peek to making sure they're on the right foot, right? And um, that's really what you want uh, for a variety of reasons. One is that that's the kind of learning environment that they're going to be in most often as writers after they leave your class. Um, when they're working on a piece of writing, at their, next, at their first job, wherever it might be. And so if they're equipped to use that kind of dynamic, to ask the right questions, to get good feedback, and to use that feedback when they do get it to make uh, strong revisions, they'll be in great shape. And so those habits are every bit as important as the habits that you teach them when they're on their own, how to evaluate a, a source, um, how to use secondary source material to support an argument. Those are great things that we associate with the drafting moment. But we're also talking about some transferable things they can take with them in the moment of review and revision. So we want moments like this. Um, I had a daughter in dance class once when she was that age. I saw a lot of those things. So who's on the right foot here? It's hard to tell, right? Um, and that's another thing I like to emphasize, that the zone of proximal development and this notion of a more capable peer that it depends on isn't some strong hierarchy where one person is always the leader. It's much more fluid. It's much more of a dynamic where one minute in one part of the song, I know all the steps. But then in the next, there's that part that I just never got down, but my peer partner knows a little better than me. And so if we can help one another, and we're on the stage together. We can both do more than we could do alone. And that's the essence of what you want in a peer learning workshop, right? So let's talk about how we cultivate that in our classrooms. Um, so first of all, let's talk about what you can do um, just on a basic level that to make your class a little bit more like a dance class. because. They do something in dance class that's really important, and we don't often think to do the same thing, even though we want that kind of studio atmosphere. And that is, we break things up into small chunks in a dance class, 
and we rehearse them in shorter pieces before we put them all together, right? So the most popular thing you hear in dance class or in music class or in marching band, whatever you might be doing something like this, you, you hear them go, okay, we're going to do the first eight. Let's go. One, two, three. All right, now we're going to do that again. That was great. Again? I thought you said it was great. Yes, two more times. Seriously, right? But those repetitions matter. That's actually how you learn. The mistake that we make often in writing classes is that we simply don't schedule enough of the stuff to make it stick. So if your classroom schedule looks like the top line, where let's say that's a two-week schedule for a paper, and most of the time is drafting, you leave very little time for review and revision, then they're not going to come away with as balanced a skill set in that area. They just won't have as many repetitions. So um, process pedagogy always encourages us to have more interventions, to do smaller bits. But the reason why is so that we can fit more write, review, revise, write, review, revise, write, review, revise. So it's a little bit more like a dance class. So hopefully you're not feeling like nervous right now. If, you're, if your class looks a little bit more, your schedule looks a little bit more like the top line than the bottom, that's OK. Because you can still, even if you have a drafting section um, that's pretty long before you see the first complete draft. Um, you can still actually break that up um, fairly uh, easily by just having them bring in pieces of their writing to share earlier that are not the whole thing, right? So you might have them bring in a thesis statement one day, and you do a little workshop just on the on the thesis, just a little tiny piece of writing, or maybe if you're um, having a, uh, if the assignment is on a uh, research paper where they have to use external sources and you want to make sure that they're doing a good job summarizing that external source, maybe you have them bring in a few sentences of summary of their external source and they workshop one each. Right? And you talk about what makes an effective summary that day and that's what your review is. So we're not talking about changing the nature of what you're assigning. We're not even necessarily talking about changing the paper at all. We're just trying to find where are the moments where we can focus on something, get another feedback cycle in there, so that we can practice not just drafting, but review and revision too. Make sense? OK, so that's step one. This is uh, one takeaway. More opportunities, more reps, more repetition. Let's do it three more times. And, and here's where um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a little bit more of a, a case for you. And I don't have time to go into all the, the research evidence for why, this, this is, why we think this is um, a good thing to do. But I'm happy to share that with you. And I have some links here um, where you can read some more about this. But um, there's, there's fairly good evidence. And by good, I mean of the kind that they consider good in medicine a multi-study uh, multi meta-analysis of uh, with lots of effect sizes, 78, I think, different studies, um, and uh, of writing pedagogies and which things move the needle when it comes to writing performance, right? So there's, there was one that was published in about 2008. And it asks a fairly straightforward question. If you're going to spend time with students in the writing classroom doing stuff, what stuff makes the most difference at the end? Right? And two things really rose to the top. One was revision. That was the top one. Revision with a focus on higher order concerns is the thing that helps them write more, better later. It sticks the best, and it produces the biggest gains overall. And this is from a range of, of ages, too. Um, this particular analysis was published in uh, education journals. So they're really looking at K-12 as well as higher ed. The second thing was review as long as it's criterion referenced. 
So they're looking at a text, they have some criteria, and they're making some choices about whether or not the text meets those criteria or doesn't meet it and how. So you could probably see how those things are pretty effective because they give the students an, an ability to read critically their own work as well as the work of others. And it provides them with some ability to understand how to improve a text later, right? So it doesn't, it isn't a, a, a big surprise that, that this is going to be a valuable thing. It's just that now we have to really figure out how do we do more of it, right? Let me give you a sense of why I think that's the case, and then maybe you'll be convinced to do some more of it. Because part of what we're doing is you're going to have to give up, in some cases, some other things that you're doing in class in order to make some room for more review and revision. Um, so you might be reluctant to do that, and I understand that. So I'm not asking for all the time, but here is what I think is happening when you do that. It comes down to practicing revision decisions. Um, so let's think about three different things that students could get better at. I learned all of this myself. I don't know about all of you, but I worked in the writing center as a peer tutor all through my undergrad. And if you ask me, that's where I really got to be a better writer because I spent all my time while I was there not only imagining how to make this paper better, but not saying it directly and trying to get them to say it, right? which is what the whole Writing Center deal is all about. But what did I get better at? I got better at problem detection. right? So what makes for a good text? I had to know the criteria, and then I had to recognize the criteria themselves for a value hierarchy that they were in. So just fixing the grammar mistakes isn't going to address a problem if there are claims with no evidence attached. Right? So I had to be able to separate higher order from lower order concerns. So all by itself, before we bring this, the writing in at all, just having a sense of what the criteria are. Then applying those criteria to the text that's in front of you. Right? So localizing those criteria. Point to the areas where this text doesn't measure up and why. And then finally, a solution to that problem we identified, imagining a better text. How would I revise this to get closer to that standard that's in the criteria? What could I do differently? When you, when you have folks sit in peer response groups and do work through these kinds of stages, um, Another thing happens that's not on here, which is they have to say that last thing out loud. Right? They, they have to make it explicit to someone else. What would make this text better? When that happens, they can add it to their own repertoire. And they can go, oh, I ought to do that. They don't always make that connection, by the way. <laughs> All right, so that's a lot, right? But I've made it simple for you. Are you ready? This is the thing you can use. It's really three steps. When they leave a comment on their, on their peer's paper, ask them to do three things, three sentences even. Describe what you see. Evaluate it with a reference to the criteria. And make a suggestion for how to make it better. That's it. Describe, evaluate, suggest. D-E-S, describe, evaluate, suggest. In my class, I actually have them practice writing these DES pattern comments. And we practice the first time we do a peer review doing them. And it's a little funny. Um, and I try to lighten the mood a little bit. I'm going to give you a, a link at the end of this to a little video. And I'll say, um, what I like to say is that this, this way of giving comments is not just for helping your fellow students with their papers. It's for helping all of your relationships. So, for example, imagine a scenario where uh, you and your partner are thinking about or talking about where to go to eat, which is always an easy decision. <laughs> and they offer you a suggestion, and you're not on board. How do you respond? 
describe, evaluate, suggest. <laughs> Don't go right to the evaluative moment. Don't go, ooh, that's, that's just hurtful. It's just, <laughs> that's hurtful. just is. First, describe. Well, I had tacos for lunch. They were awesome. I love tacos, and tacos are a great suggestion. They're a healthy choice, which is what we're looking for. However, what would you think about Mediterranean? Also a healthy choice, plenty of fresh ingredients, good balance of vegetables and protein, and there's one right around the corner. <laughs> so what did I do? I did describe, evaluate, suggest, right? And now I have a happy marriage still <laughs> for one more day. So that's what we do. So you all want to try one? So pair up, and I want you to think about a parallel scenario. So you could either do the one that we just did, um, or here's one I like to do with coworkers. So let's imagine that one of you is a coworker, that you have to buy a gift for your supervisor. And one of you has just given the other one what they think is a terrible idea for a gift. <laughs> so one of you gets to play the terrible gift giver, and you have to think of a truly awful gift. That's <laughs> exciting. And the other has to break it to the other person <laughs> that there might be a better choice. You want to try that out? Sure. And think consciously about this DES, describe, evaluate, suggest. Have some fun with it. Okay, do you want to come back together a little bit? How did it go? Is this a pattern that makes sense to you? So, what was the worst gift? The worst one. Coffee mug, yeah, kind of, yeah. Uninspired. Those are really bad. Oh, yeah. I was, I was go with a puppy. Yeah, you stick them to your back when your back hurts. Oh wow. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I. There you go. You just don't know. You don't know. I go with a puppy always. That's a terrible, it's a terrible gift. You can defend it. You know, they're very cute, but not a good gift. So, yeah, exactly. You never know. So thank you for uh, indulging us on that. The, the practice is the fun part. And then what we, what we like to do is come back and ask students to then put those things into practice as they give their peer comments. And what I want to give, give you is a few indicators of how you know that pattern is actually getting put to use when you see it. So first is you, you really do need to see a few of the comments written out. So you have to choose some method whereby they share some with you. Um, but you don't have to read each and every one. Um, one, of the, one of the tricks that we've noticed and we just finished a study where we looked at 60 different classrooms at all kinds of higher ed institutions, from community college to law school, actually. And we pulled samples from uh, the student comments across all of those kinds. And what we found is that the DES pattern shows up pretty reliably only if there are 20 words or more. And that's just because you can't fit all three things into less than 20 words. I mean, maybe some of you experts can, but the first year writing students, probably not, right? So before you even, before you even see the substance, you could kind of get a feel like, eh, these are probably just a, you know, yay or whatever, or an editing comment. Yeah. Um, so, so that's one indicator. It's very basic. Right? And you don't want to stop there, but it can actually help you establish a floor. And it can tell you whether or not, oh yeah, maybe we should spend a little bit more time, take this a little bit more seriously. The other way is that you'll actually start seeing some of these suggestions show up in a revision plan if you ask for those. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So this is the other strategy 
that we recommend is that you don't stop with the giving of the feedback, but you ask the students to save some of the most helpful comments, the ones that they intend to act on, and show you those when they show you their draft. Um, the nice thing about that is that then you have something to indicate whether they see the priorities for revision the way you do. Um, this is often a matter of just scheduling things slightly differently so that you have peer review day before they turn the draft into you for your feedback so that you get the draft plus their revision comments, right? And you're seeing, oh yeah, this is what they think is important. Really helpful. It can speed up the time that it takes you to respond because if you agree with all those things, you can say, I agree, go to it, right? You might add a few. But in principle, they're, on, they're in good shape. The other thing you could do is you can look across those plans and you can say, wow, nobody sees this major issue that I need to really talk about next time we meet. Because it's not none of the plans. So let's talk about that structure. Um, one of the things I, I thought I would show you a few comments here. <coughs> These are good ones that follow the pattern. This is what you should expect to see if you spend some time teaching the commenting like this. Um, these are the kinds of comments. They don't have to be super long, but they're very helpful. And you can see here we have some indicators from Eli that um, that we also show teachers when the r r writer finds them helpful, they can give it some stars, but they can also add it to their revision plan. So you see the little green check mark? So I can see that and go, oh yeah, it's on their plan. And then I can endorse it too. I can give a teacher endorsement and go, yes, good. Um, and all that happens before the draft comes, which is really nice. But you can do this without, it doesn't take this particular software to do that. But really what I wanted to show you is, is what the substance of those helpful comments looks like. So the reviewer can make some really good moves here. And over time, you start to gain a lot of confidence in what their writing ability is, even if it doesn't show up in their drafts. So in this bottom one here, um, we were able to say to Kate, hey, Kate, that advice you gave to Emma, you should take that advice in your draft. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the revising one. Describe, evaluate, suggest is your commenting pattern. We have one for revision plans too. Isn't that nice? It is select, prioritize, and reflect. So, Select is easy, it's what it sounds like. Pick the feedback that you think is useful. Arrange it in priority order. And this is your revision plan. First thing to do, most important thing to do. And here is where you as the instructor can actually have some, um, should have some influence based on where you are in the writing process maybe. And also, what kind of thing you're focusing on in the in the class that you're teaching. If you're teaching tech writing versus first year writing, or if you're teaching a research paper versus a personal essay, or a literacy narrative, you may have different um, prompts for how they prioritize. So for example, early in a draft cycle, um, we may want them to prioritize higher order concerns over lower order concerns. Right? That's a pretty common thing. So if those priorities come in the other way, now you know what, what to say to them. And if you see that as a pattern, you say it to the whole group, not just to a single person. Um, the other thing that we want to do is encourage them to reflect. This is, the, this is really the, the, the place where they start to become aware of how their choices will help address the criteria. So this is a moment where they come back. In a way, they're commenting to themselves. So these reflections, the key here is the same with a helpful evaluative step in the commenting, which is, is it criterion referenced? Right? So in order to make my paper more this, 
I'm going to take this piece of advice. And that's really what we want to see in that reflection moment. So we have describe, evaluate, suggest, select, prioritize, reflect. Does that make sense? Um, funny story, I was on the plane on the way here and I had two revisions to do, full of feedback. And reviewer one and reviewer two did not agree. They never do. So I was doing this, right? So I started with exactly this. I was like, all right, I have an hour or so, an hour and a half before, uh, you know, on this airplane where I can't do anything else. So I'm going to pick the four or five pieces of feedback that I think are, I'm going to make uh, some reference to. Then I'm going to put them in order. What am I going to do first? In my case, I picked the thing that I thought would affect the most chunks of the text, the most global to the most contained, because that was my priority at the time. And then continually, but also at the end, I had to write a little note to my co-author to say, OK, Re reviewer one and reviewer two were kind of pulling us in different directions here. But I liked what reviewer one said, and so, and reviewer two also told us to cut 500 words. So I decided, <laughs> here's what I was going to do. I changed the focus earlier on, and that let me uh, be more specific in that passage, which is one of the things reviewer two wanted. And then that let me cut out a paragraph later, which is one of the things reviewer one wanted. And this other thing of reviewer one, I'm ignoring that for now. <laughs> and so I had to actually sort of go back through and say, what did I just do to this paper that I think will make it better? That step is often the most difficult for students. And the, there's a simple reason why. Um, you're there helping them with the goal that at the end they'll be a better writer, right? They're there with the goal often at the end they'll be done, <laughs> right? They want to be done. They don't want to be endlessly revising in order to get better. And so this is the, this is the attitude shift, I guess, that accompanies this, which is to say, when you ask students to go through this process, I think you really have to come back to that dance studio metaphor and say, look, we're always going to be able to find something to improve, right? We get the top line down, then we're going to work on our feet. Then we're going to work on being together. Then we're going to work on musicality. There's always going to be ways to refine our, our performance. And the goal at the end is not a perfect dance, not a perfect paper. It's a better you, a better dancer, a better writer. And so I'm, I just, I'm trying to level with you here because they're not always there. They just want it to be over with. So often their priorities are, what's the least amount of stuff I have to do <laughs> to call this good, right? And so that's, that's hidden sometimes in terms of the logic. Um, are there questions about these two patterns? Yeah. I have a question. So I'm a high school teacher, not a university teacher. And the reason why I came to this workshop is because I like to know how, to, how do I take my lower functioning students that struggle with writing as is to that level that they can actually give positive feedback or critical feedback to another writer. Yeah. Because some of our students may emerge to be there. Some of, other, some of our other students have not emerged to that level yet. And I'm assuming even at the college level, when they come in from our high schools, that the college teachers are seeing the same issues. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so one, one of the nice things about working with the large group of folks that we have with Eli is that we are working in, at all grade levels. and. Um, I think there's a way in which doing this earlier 
focusing more on giving and receiving feedback in the early grades is even more beneficial. And for one is they lose the stigma associated with asking for help and using that feedback and expecting to, to, to do a revision. Um, the, the other is that they, um, they have a different sense of the time that it will take. Right? So um, the, the thing that we see in the high school space or in the K-12 space in Michigan, at, at least, and I'm not sure how it works in Arizona, but you have to let me know, is that they, they are often opportunities because there are these grade level um, specific markers that they have to hit that are indexed to things that they need to demonstrate. You can actually scaffold these kinds of uh, peer responses around those learning outcomes a little more directly. So in a way, you have a, you have a little bit clearer roadmap than we have in first year writing because your curriculum says by the sixth month of fifth grade, they need to be able to do this, right? Um, we have teachers who use, who turn in their revision plan students' revision plans as evidence that they're hitting their, their marks for that. Because right there are, is a clear link between um, the criteria and their ability to identify it and, and act on it. So um, that was a surprise to us, but that, that actually happened for the first time at Oakland ISD in um, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit, suburban Detroit. And we had the intermediate school district person write us and say, can we get just the revision plans from this whole school district? And we said, yeah, but tell us what you're interested in. And they said, well, we think that that's one of the better places for showing these intermediate learning outcomes, is what do they put on a revision plan as areas to improve? That's kind of interesting. What I find for, for first year writing instructors is if, if you have shared learning outcomes or even if you just use a fairly comprehensive holistic rubric, um, there's something that my colleague Bump Halberter, who is our WPA at MSU, calls the all at onceness of writing. Um, it's very hard to pick from those things at any given time what you want students to demonstrate on any given day. And so you really have to work hard to build that scaffold. And you have to kind of know where they are. So you need a little diagnostic minute to get to know, OK, who is this group of students? What do they really need to work on? And then you have to make a kind of a thing that feels like a commitment, which says, in this paper, I'm going to let some of the things go because I'm really going to focus on this other thing. And that's, that can be difficult, right? And it's, it's made challenging if you have a common set of assignments where the, the genres that you are working in afford some things and not others, right? So, yeah, it's tricky. I don't know how, um, I was talking a little bit with Sean on the way in, and he said that the instructors do have a fair amount of ability to adjust what they're doing, but do you have a shared set of outcomes that you work towards? So that's where we would recommend is kind of pick some of your learning outcomes and s start there and work back to talk a little bit about, well, what would I really like to see them talking with each other about in paper one? And in addition to what they're writing for their paper, what do I want the discourse about their writing, the meta discourse, to be about? And that's going to be a subset of those learning outcomes. Yeah. Uh, does this model work well with digital and multimodal text? Yeah, um, yeah, I think actually it's really good for um, timeline-based editing in particular. So, um, so there I'm talking about any kind of media that people experience ser serially, so sound or video. And that's because that too is overwhelming to the reviewer often at first. So part of what you're teaching them to do is to work through something um, and apply a set of criteria to it in a way that can be actionable to the, the person who has to make the changes. Um, often they will, they will resort. So what's the most common pattern you see uh, 
uh, I'll tell you what mine is. You can tell me if this is true for you too. Um, when students are first getting in peer response groups for the first time, what you see is that they immediately jump to the evaluative statement rather than the descriptive. And it's always positive because they're really trying to not be mean, right? <laughs> so if they're showing videos, let's say, um, with one, to one another, and especially they know that this person put hours into it, they are not going to tear it apart, <laughs> first thing. And so what you're able to do with something like this is um, give them a mechanism to, to create some actionable feedback that doesn't feel mean. Suggestion part, um, which was in the first simple pattern. Um, yeah. Um, so in your description, it said uh, offer a question or a strategy to improve the job to elicit the question. But uh, when I teach, I often see like students going. So what did you do? Um, like they, they basically focus on like basic information of the text and they don't come up with a question that elicits you know solution from the writers and stuff uh, is there any like suggestion that you can that like we can give to the students to elicit more sophisticated questions or suggestions? yeah it, it's it's the hardest piece to do it really is um, even when you're I don't know how uh, you like to do your grading, but if you're doing your peer response or your um, rough draft feedback where you're actually giving them some formative feedback, I notice that after four or five, I start running out of stuff to, you know, my brain is just like, eh, gotta, gotta walk away, right? So you can only do so many. Um, yeah, I think that. Um, the, the key there is two, one, two things to do. So one is they, w when you see these kinds of, of um, really good suggestions, help them to see what the form of those suggestions is by promoting some, some of the good ones to the whole class. So, so you pull up a few, you know, ask the person if it's okay to share, and say, look at, look at what Kate has done here. Right? So that's one. The other is always go back to the criteria if you can. So it's really a closed loop. The, the, the scribe evaluate suggest pattern works best when it's a loop. When, it, when you say, I see this thing happening, here's the criteria that it, that it either meets or doesn't meet. And if you did this, it would look like this other way, which would then meet the criteria again, which, right? So it, it kind of comes around that way. Um, so I always point them back to that. So if they're, if they're having trouble, if they, they spot a problem, they're like, eh, the, what they'll often say, what's a, what's a common student saying? It just doesn't flow, right? <laughs> like, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, show me the place, and let's, let's talk about where is the, what, what criteria are we talking about there, right? Um, grabbing the attention of the reader, maybe, or um, making a making a connection with a a narrative element that the reader can relate to. All right, so now we're getting a little bit more specific, and now we can ta turn that into a suggestion. It really does become a way to to introduce the learning outcomes that you're working with, or even the goals of the assignment itself back into the class as a kind of core resource for them. So you talked about the comments as being like, if you came in after the students yeah. have put comments on, um, and either like just, like on your system, you have like a like an accept button. Do yep. you often like, like on the Google Doc, you can put comments on comments. Like, can you, like, do you often just be like, the, like, I agree with so and so. If if a paper has like twenty comments on it already, and you mm -hmm. agree with all of those, you can just kind of go in and. 
Like, does it slow, like, speed up your reading process a little bit, I guess? Yeah, I, actually, my, what I do these days is I do less, I do endorse the comments, but I do that mostly for the commenter rather than the writer, so that the commenter knows that they've made a good comment. Um, but what I do now is even one more step removed, is um, I comment on a draft only if it has a revision plan on it. And the revision plan has the comments on it that they intend to act on. So that's really what speeds things up for me. Um, and the reason why is that my response is about getting them to revise anyway. Now that I have a plan, I can e either agree with the plan or differ with the plan. Um, and I'm still going to go back and point to things that I see in their document, right? But I'm going to do it with reference to what they already have down there. And you're a mat like the imaginative staff after four or five, or four or five, you've already kind of got that there, so you don't feel like. Yeah. And so uh, what it also lets you do is if you have a group where maybe one of the people didn't get great feedback, Right? They had a couple of peers that were like uninspired that day, <laughs> undercaffeinated, I like to say. Then maybe you can fill in the gaps there. But, in, but there will be others who got really good feedback. And you could say, I think you should listen to Kate. She's got great feedback for you. And so that does speed me up a little bit. And I don't feel guilty about that at all. And here's why. So. Um, Remember, I came back to this idea that we're teaching a set of transferable practices. I don't think of them as skills. I really do. I'm fully invested in this whole dance scenario. Um, you can think of it as yoga. You can think of it whatever you want. But it's a practice. And these practices that come later in the writing process are really um, super valuable. And so here they are kind of enumerated. Like when we, when we teach more revision, we're really helping them to see knowing what they can change, knowing how to change, knowing why it will improve. If they can walk away knowing those things, they're really much, much better off. So that's really what I'm trying to do. And so it is easier if the student gave good feedback to someone else before that, right? Because you know they're capable of it. I've seen you give good feedback. I know you can do this, right? Um, but then there are also, this is what I've been trying to level with you on, because it's not always about ability. It's, they have to want to do it instead of just being done. Um, they have to have time. And that means I have to make time for them in the course schedule, but they also have to leave time <laughs> um, in their lives. So they have to budget their time differently. And a lot of times I end up, if so let's say I've, we've gone through this process, um, and this actually often happens with good students. And they just aren't responsive to the, to the feedback they got. They might, got. they might have gotten good feedback. There are ways to improve the, the draft. But the draft that they turn in is really just an edited version of the first draft. And they're used to that being enough. And I, they're, they're a little surprised when I send it back one more time and go, no. You had a really good plan. What happened? Oh, well, I just didn't leave time to do it. I'm like, OK, yeah, all right. So that I get, right? It's not about can you do it. It's just that we did, you just didn't do it. Um, so then you have a different kind of conversation with them. Um, and then, I think the hardest one of all, I put this one down there. For folks who've had, who've kind of gotten, who've been beat up by a school in their lives and haven't had a positive reinforcing experience in, in their lives as, as students, um, you often have another hurdle to cross, which is they have to believe that making these changes are actually going to help them achieve something. They have to believe it's worth it. And that's often what's happening, is that at the end of the day, they might know what to change, know how to change it, know why it will make it better. They may want to do it. They may have had time to do it. But in the end, eh, 
They just didn't think it would amount to much. So they didn't do it. I get a lot, I get a lot of that. It's kind of a weird cost-benefit analysis that they do. And often, you know, if you level with them at that moment and say, okay, well, but, you know, that's a B paper then, not an A. It could have been an A. And they're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> right? They, that's what they, they're, cool. they're not okay with it, but they've, they've made that adjustment to themselves. So it's not a, it's not a guarantee. It, it, but there you go. So giver's gain this is what we call it. Um, I have one more appeal that I like to use, especially with the upper division students and students in professional and technical writing, and it's much more straightforward. Um, I'll, I'll get to that one in a minute. But what it comes down to, and this is what I want you to believe, is that spending, the time, spending more time helping them give good feedback is actually worthwhile. It's as valuable a thing you can do in class as other things, and that's because what you read you can imitate, what you detect, you can correct. What you explain, you can retain. And what you suggest, you can try. You're building their repertoire of writerly moves when you, spend, when you invest the time in helping them learn to give good feedback. Just doing peer response groups, it may or may not happen. But if you teach it and coach it the way that we're talking about, it's, it pays off. So here's the appeal for those other students. There are many jobs where once you're past the entry level, the success you will have in your career depends on your ability to give good feedback. I have one of those jobs right now. Shirley has one of those jobs right now. Um, most days I spend most of my time reviewing stuff and giving other people suggestions about how to make it better. And that's true just past the entry level in just about every professional job you can name. Uh, I was talking on the way over here with Sean, and um, I, was, I was talking about a, a colleague of, of yours who we now are lucky to have at Michigan State, Dawn Opal. Some of you might know Dawn. And Dawn, before she came back to um, uh, academia, was a lawyer. And she likes to remind people that as a junior associate, all you do is get feedback pelted at you, and you have to make changes. And then some crazy day you walk in, and you're, an associate, you're a partner, and all of a sudden you have to be giving feedback right? and helping other people use it. And that's really that's the, the sum total of what you're doing when you practice law. So I think learning to give good feedback in its own right, valuable career skill directly relatable to being a good leader. It is the thing, it won't get you hired, but it'll get you promoted. There you go. More revision decisions, that's what we're after. It's that simple. So it can get complicated, but I don't want to leave it you with a complicated statement. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to build some of this into your class. And if you do, let me know how it goes. I would like to hear about it. Um, there are some resources here. Uh, we have, um, at, on Eli, we have created some modules to introduce students to the, the what and why that I just talked to you about. And they are... Technology agnostic, you don't have to use Eli, it doesn't reference Eli. They really reference some uh, research on feedback, and a, especially a guy named Hattie, uh, who's a well-known education researcher who has studied feedback. Um, and they're written for students. They introduce that describe, evaluate, suggest pattern. There's a ridiculous video with me in it, uh, talking about tacos, like I just did. and. Um, other stuff. So you can use it in your class and there's a little exercise if you want to use it there too. It's all um, Creative Commons and um, use it as much as you want for free. Um, there's also a companion to that which is using feedback and that's the revision plan one and that's the pr describe, um, 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 select, prioritize, reflect. So feel free, knock yourself out. Um, and 
there's for the more brown baggy moments like this. We did a whole series about a uh, year, maybe two years now. I guess this is it's now two years old. Um, where we drew on the research on peer learning generally, and we tried to surface what we see as the biggest opportunities and challenges associated with peer learning in the classroom. And um, we summarized that in a series of blog posts. They're all evidence-driven, but they're very readable. And we tried to make each one of them about brown bag size so that you could have a little staff meeting about them or a mentor meeting. Um, and they bring up issues and they suggest some strategies for addressing those issues. So one, one example would be, um, uh, the first one is called, your, your students aren't revising enough. What, what should we do about that? And we both mean enough, not deeply enough, and also not frequently enough, right? Um, another one is, okay, they're doing review, but it's not reciprocal. I have way unbalanced reciprocity across my class. Maybe that's because I have students from different, um, who come in prepared to very differently. How do I deal with that problem? So that's the nature of this series. And there are about, I don't know, nine of them. So um, feel free to use those. Um, this link surely has, and you can send it to the group. Um, these are also free. Feel free to use them. I hope that they're helpful. And that's it. Okay. Right at an hour. We have some time for questions, though. I've got a few minutes here for questions. Yeah. What did that simple slide say? That I got the first two because they were from the beginning. But um, what was that last piece on the here's your like snapshot just before you gave it that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. strategies for having students develop their own criteria? Um, say, I have students do whatever kind of you know, genre or project they want. What do you do? Yeah, um, I think that's, that's a really good one. And it's especially useful in um, when I teach, I often teach tech writing. It's kind of my own background. And um, I always have them derive the criteria from the user group that they're going to write for, um, often by talking to them directly or by observing them or something like that. Um, so yes, and so here's what we do is, this is, I kind of alluded to this, but let me make it a little more clear. For those projects, what I do is a, a kind of, I think of it as an inside out assignment. So we design the rubric as the first step, and we work backward from the idea of what would help one of these, an instance of this genre to be a success with its audience. What, what would that look like? What would the, how would the people react to it? What would the features of the text look like? And from that, we work backwards to a prompt for the writer. And so we kind of come at it from the guts of the review. And then um, those, that first conversation, they'll see those, those criteria again when we do the first peer review. And I'll say, remember these? You came up with them. So let's talk about which ones are most important and which ones this review will focus on. So in tech writing, for example, there's often a desire for three big things and they're in tension with one another. So one is accuracy. One is clarity, and one is brevity, <laughs> right? So make it right, make it clear, and now make it short. So we talk about those three, and we often do different review rounds for each three. So we get as focused as we can on what, those, what each of those are. And I really want them to see and feel how those, how those different demands for those things can pull, tug them in different directions. It helps explain why some manuals are impossible to read. Um, 
because they didn't attend to one of those things or they overbalance between those things. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's one that is in my toolkit. Well, let's, let's call this officially over. Mm -hmm. We could be here for a few minutes more. Sure, uh, yeah. Talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Good luck. Have a great semester. <laughs>